the younger students can go to their classes. Amen. And you may be seated this morning. Let's get into our Bible lesson. Today's our last lesson in this book. So hopefully you've got another book for next week. We'll start <clears throat> with our new book. If you've got a Sunday school book, it'd be a terrible thing to go to hell because you didn't pay for your Sunday school book. But that's called theft. Somebody say praise the Lord. Well, the Lord will forgive me. Yeah, but if you're going to hold it and not pay for it, you ought to just give it back. And I think everybody has. I haven't heard. But make sure you take care of paying for that. Amen. <clears throat> the things of God are more valuable than what we can pay for them anyway. So, Exodus chapter 7 this morning, our lesson is the role of the prophet and the role of prophecy. I will tell you, there is the office of prophet that's given to the church. But then there is the gift of prophecy that's also given to believers. Not everyone that prophesies is in the office of a prophet. A prophet has a certain place that God has given them, part of the five-fold ministry. But there are a lot of people that can prophesy that do not or are not called to the role of a prophet. We know this because in Acts it says, your sons and daughters shall prophesy. So God can use lots of people in lots of ways. Amen? <clears throat> but we're talking about prophets and prophecy this morning. Exodus 7 verse 1 through 2. <clears throat> Thank you. Then the Lord said to Moses, pay close attention to this. I will make you seem like God to Pharaoh. Your brother Aaron will be your prophet and he will speak for you. And that's what prophets do. They speak for God. Amen. That's why sometimes they can be very abrasive. Because yeah. God's, God's not, he's not trying to be politically correct and God's not woke. God will hurt your feelings to try to get you to heaven. If you tell God there's more than two sexes, he'll look at you and say, you're wrong. I made them, I know. And so sometimes a prophet can be very abrasive. Pastors are usually not that abrasive. We try to not ruffle any feathers and ta-ta the sheep and pass out cotton candy every once in a while. And not a prophet. If a prophet comes through, he'll just put his finger in your face and say, no, that's not the way we do it. And there's a time for that. Not all the time. And they prophets have to learn a little tact. When I say prophet, I'm talking about I'm not talking about the gift of prophecy. I'm talking about the office of a prophet. They can be very forward because when God uses somebody to say something, God's not He's not trying to mince words. God's not trying to figure out if He really wants to say this or not. Once He says it, He means it, and He wants it said. Telling tell Aaron everything I say to you, Moses, and have him announce it to Pharaoh. He will demand that the people of Israel be allowed to leave. Notice he's going to demand it. He going the prophet Aaron's going to walk in, put his finger in the king's face, and say, "Let them go." That's right. That's pretty bold. That's the office of a prophet. Let's go now to Numbers chapter 12. I'm going to start in verse 1. Numbers chapter 12, verse 1. There's so much good stuff in this chapter. I just want to read it, read it all to you. So I'm going to give you a little extra today. While they were at Hazaroth, Miriam and Aaron criticized Moses because he had married a Cushite woman. They said, has the Lord spoken only through Moses? Hasn't he spoken through us too? But the Lord heard them. Now the Lord had used them. They had ministry. But they overstepped their ministry Amen. by trying to overstep Moses. That's why if, any, if you ever have a minister that's not under somebody, you better get out from under them. Because right. everybody needs to be under ministry. Now Moses was more humble than any other person on earth. So immediately the Lord called to Moses 
Aaron and Miriam and said, now I think what the Bible says when the, says Moses was humble, another version says he was the meekest man on earth. Meekness is not weakness, it's just controlling yourself. And Moses would not fight with his brother and sister. They were trying to stir something up and he wouldn't get, you know, it takes two to fight. It's hard to fight somebody that just won't fight with you. But Moses would not fight for what God gave him. He left it in God's hands. So immediately the Lord called to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam and said, Go out to the tabernacle, all you, all three of you. And the three of them went out. Then the Lord descended in a pillar of cloud and stood at the entrance of the tabernacle. Aaron and Miriam, he called, and they stepped forward. And the Lord said to them, Now listen to me, even with prophets, I, the Lord, communicate by visions and dreams. And that's true. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall see visions. Your young men shall your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And so the Lord said that I will do that. But that is not how I communicate with my servant Moses. He is entrusted with my entire house. I speak to him face to face directly and not in riddles. He sees the Lord as he is. Should you not be afraid to criticize him? Him, the Lord said. So I always warn us, don't put your mouth on a preacher. Amen. Yeah, but he married somebody he shouldn't have married. You better keep your mouth off of him. They had rationalized their reason for putting their mouth on the preacher, and God come and took care of it. The Lord was furious with them, and he departed. As the cloud moved from above the tabernacle, Miriam suddenly became white as snow with leprosy. When Aaron saw what had happened, he cried out to Moses, Oh, my Lord, please don't punish us for this sin we have so foolishly committed. Don't let her be like a stillborn baby already decayed at birth. So Moses cried out to the Lord, Heal her, O God, I beg you. And the Lord said to Moses, if her father had spit in her face, wouldn't she have been defiled for seven days? Banish her from the camp for seven days, and after that, she may return. I believe that was the process of her healing. Is she going to obey Moses now? Notice she has to obey. God got her into a situation where she had to humble herself. So Miriam was excluded from the camp for seven days, and the people waited until she was brought back before they traveled again. Finally, verse 16, then they left Hazeroth and camped in the wilderness of Paran. Finally, go to Deuteronomy chapter 18. Deuteronomy 18, and I'll begin in verse 9. Deuteronomy 18 and verse 9. When you arrive in the land the Lord your God is giving you, be very careful not to imitate the detestable customs of the nations living there. For example, never sacrifice your son or daughter as a burnt offering and do not let your people practice fortune telling or sorcery or allow them to interpret omens or engage in witchcraft. Dear brothers and sisters, stay away from tarot cards. Stay away from horoscopes. You got no business in that stuff. There are spirits aligned with that stuff that God don't want you messing with. You cannot invite the devil into your house and then ask God to make him leave. If you invite him in, you're going to have to live with him. Oh God, help me. And God says, go clean your house up. Or sometimes we repent. We don't need to repent. We need to go clean our house up. God's not coming to our house to clean it. No. You want to hurt people's feelings, tell them they're going to have to do more than have oil poured on their head. They want to just have an oil treatment and they're all taken care of. No, you go home and quit watching that. Quit doing that. Get rid of that. Oh, this spirit just got me bound down. I'm always defeated. You got something you need to get rid of. Right. You don't need prayer. You need discipline. Yes. Our cast spells, our function as mediums or psychics. You don't need no psychic. Don't call 1-800-PSYCHIC to find out what's going to happen tomorrow. God does not want you to do that. Right. Amen. 
You don't have to go to church here, but I'm going to tell you the truth. You are only hurting yourself when you mess with that stuff. Function as mediums or psychics or call forth the spirits of the dead. Anyone who does these things is an object of horror and disgust to the Lord. It is because the other nations have done these things that the Lord your God will drive them out ahead of you. You must be blameless before the Lord your God. The people are... The people you are about to displace consult with sorcerers and fortune tellers, but the Lord your God forbids you to do such things. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your fellow Israelites, and you must listen to that prophet. God's got his own future tellers. Sure. He don't want you to mess with the world. Well, they had a healing in their service. Well, they're not telling the truth about who Jesus is. We don't follow miracles. We follow the word. We follow the word and miracles follow us. For this is what you yourselves requested of the Lord, your God, when you were assembled at Mount Sinai. You begged that you might never again have to listen to the voice of the Lord, your God, or see the blazing fire for fear you would die. Then the Lord said to Moses, fine, I will do as they have requested. I will raise up a prophet like you from among their fellow Israelites. And I will tell that prophet what to say, and he will tell the people everything I command him. I will personally deal with anyone who will not listen to the messages the prophet proclaims on my behalf. Verse 19 down through verse 22 but any prophet who claims to give a message from another God or who falsely claims to speak from me must die. You may wonder, how will we know whether the prophecy is from the Lord or not? Here's how you know. If the prophet predicts something in the Lord's name and it does not happen, the Lord did not give that message. The prophet has spoken of his own and, needs to, and need not be feared. Because when God says something's going to happen, it's already happened. Amen. God don't make mistakes. He knows the beginning from the end. Amen. And so it was a dangerous thing to play prophet in the Lord's name in the Old Testament. I would tell you it's still dangerous today. Now we don't stone folks. But you will suffer the vengeance of God if you declare things in God's name that God did not say. Be very careful when you say, the Lord said. Because if the Lord didn't say it, you're in trouble. Somebody say, praise the Lord. Before fake news was a worldwide pest, False prophecy caused people to scratch their heads and shrug their shoulders. Was prophecy really true? They thought all through the Old Testament and even the New Testament, God spoke to his people through his prophets. Many men stood in front of many crowds with the word from God for them, and, but many men also stood before the same crowds with a word from themselves for others. There have always been false prophets. And there always will be. The Bible says in the last days it's going to get worse and worse. Amen. You better know the word of God first. Amen. The scriptures. And you better decide who can speak to you in the name of the Lord after you know the gospel and the oneness of God and those kind of things. There are benchmarks. There are measuring sticks God has given us to decide who is going to be our leaders and who's going to be our prophets per se. And if you'll use those things, you have a real good chance of falling in the right place in God's economy. Amen? Amen. But prophecy is real, and God has always used that to speak to his people. It's not always been good, though. There have been a lot of prophets who've been persecuted and killed because they told people what God said. It is sometimes difficult to know. I read, one, I read just this last week. I can't remember who it was. I think I put it on our church page. It was so... So profound, but so true. 
We do not need to lower our standards to have people as members of our church who do who who are going to hell but want to go to church as a but want to go to hell as a church member. I'm gonna say that again because I got it all messed up. But the church, not just us, the church does not need to lower its standards so that people who are going to hell can be members. That's not our job. Our job is to stand forth with the word of truth. And some come and some go. We love all, but we establish the truth. That sounds like the word of a prophet right there. That would just say, no, we're not bending. It is sometimes difficult to know. But God's word will always confirm or deny prophecy, sometimes in due time. God still speaks and we must still listen. Now in the New Testament, when prophecy goes forth, the word goes forth, it is to be judged by those that hear. And we are to examine that prophecy and see if it's of God. I've heard things that I knew that wasn't God the minute it started. It's like, well, that's not God. But we have to judge those things. But we don't judge the person doing it. Because everyone makes mistakes. But you didn't dare do that in the Old Testament. But thank God for his grace and his mercy to us. Amen. In December 1901, the Ladies Home Journal published an article by John Watkins titled, What May Happen in the Next Hundred Years? Watkins did not consult psychics instead he interviewed respected scientists and university professors boy that was his mistake right there you get somebody that educated they don't know much some of their predictions had a measure of accuracy but others were laughably off base one prediction was Nicaragua and Mexico would join the United States before 2001. There would be no C, X, or Q in the English alphabet was another prediction. Russia would be the second most spoken language in the world was another prediction. I think they better learn Spanish. <laughs> it, thank God we got Brother Juan with us, our interpreter. Look at him looking around. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> it is actually eighth Russian is and there would be no animals one guy said except in zoos apparently he wasn't a deer hunter we ain't letting that kind of thing happen around here hey man as long as there's deer I'm going to survive or I'm going to try real hard They'll find me in a, in a gold deer stand somewhere with my hands gripping onto the gun. What was he doing? He was trying to survive. <laughs> I was praying and hunting. Faith without work, I still do it right now. Sister Dot, I got plenty of food in the refrigerator, but I'm sitting out there, Lord, send him by, send him by, Lord. <laughs> There's that pile of corn right there for him, God. <laughs> uh, no animals but in zoos. They were wrong. Another prediction was rats and mice would be exterminated. Please, Lord, let that happen. We killed a mouse in our church this last week. We saw him. That sucker was fast. Boy, he, he was fast. Hey, Amen. Strawberries, another prediction. Strawberries, raspberries, and blackberries would be as big as apples. They could probably do that without intervention if they just do some some of that genetic stuff they do but wouldn't that be good more boy boy that'd be good lord make the apple smaller and the strawberries bigger and we all be happier <laughs> hallelujah i've tried them apple diets they don't go very well first one or two apples you're good are pretty tasty after that it's like man where'd the sugar go lord help me I'm trying to preach. The truth is God alone knows what tomorrow holds. Sometimes he tells people what will happen so they can inform others. And we call those people prophets. And I will tell you in these last days, the Lord is going to raise up two men or two women or whatever it is. Two people to be prophets to the church. And they will be with us through the whole Tribulation. How do you know that? Because they're going to be the signal that the tribulation is over. 
And so, although the Word of God is everything we need to decide whether someone is a prophet we should listen to, the Word of God does not mean that God cannot say more than He's already said. God will not override or overrule or contradict His Word, but He can give us more instruction than we already have. And when God sends us a prophet, He's giving us a little extra that connects with the Word of God or adds on to our understanding. In these end times, God's going to send us two prophets. We're going to know who they are in due time. And they're going to strengthen us and they're going to help us to stand during these dark, dark days. Because they may have instructions we can't find in the Word of God. But we'll hold hands with the Word of God, if that makes sense, to help us to endure the times that are ahead. Amen? Amen. Amen. The first mention of a prophet in Scripture appears in Genesis 20 and 7. Go to Genesis 20 and 7. We'll read that right quick. Genesis 20 and verse 7. Now return her to her husband, and he will pray for you, for he is a prophet. Then you will live, but if you don't return her to him, you can be sure that you and your entire household will die. Who is this talking about? Abraham. Abraham had deceived King Abimelech of Gerar because Abraham's daddy and his wife's daddy was the same, but they had different mothers. He was married to his half-sister. And so he told other nations, and this is the second time Abraham did this. He did it back in chapter 12 when he went into Egypt, afraid of Pharaoh. Now back in chapter 12, his name was Abram. But in chapter 20, his name is Abraham, which means he's gone from not being in covenant to being in covenant. But you know what? He's still in the flesh. And he still falls to the deceptiveness of the flesh. Well, as Abram, he would just fall on his flesh. Yeah, but as Abraham, he was too. What a terrible thing to tell folks, that's my sister. And the inference was, it's not my wife. Both times. So it wasn't like he made one blunder and it was just, well, that was a hiccup. No, this is his second time doing it. But you know what? The Bible says he was a prophet sent by God. Can you imagine that old king, God wakes him up, gives him a vision, says, you better give that woman back to that man. And not just that, you better have that man pray for you or you're going to die. Now, wait a minute, God. You want me to go get that lying, deceiving man to pray for me? Shouldn't he pray through first? And who knows, maybe God did deal with Abraham. The Bible doesn't tell us. What he did wasn't good, wasn't right. But you don't touch the anointed of the Lord. And the only option King Abimelech had was go ask him to pray for you. Come here, you deceitful preacher. Come here, you cunning, deceptive man of God. Pray for me. That's what happened. God said, you do it or you're going to die. And he was called a prophet. When Abraham said his wife Sarah was his sister, Abimelech took her. In a dream, God warned him of his impending death if he did not return her to Abraham. Here, the only contextual clue that we have of the meaning of a prophet is prayer. That if the prophet prays for you, God will answer In Exodus 7, verses 1 through 2, we find that God told Moses, See, I have made thee a God to Pharaoh, and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. And thou shalt speak all the things I command thee, and Aaron thy brother shall speak unto Pharaoh, that he send the children of Israel out of this land. God's previous previous words to Moses concerning Aaron confirmed this when he said in Exodus 4 and 14, Is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? I know that he can speak well. And also, behold, he cometh forth to meet thee, and when he seeth thee, he will be glad in his heart. And thou shalt speak unto him and put words in his mouth, and I will be with thy mouth and with his mouth, and will teach you what ye shall say and do. 
And he shall be thy spokesman unto the people. That's what a prophet is. A spokesman unto the people of what the Lord is saying. Now, prophets may be men or women, and their words are known as prophecies. And when Aaron and Mary of Moses' siblings criticized Moses for his marriage, God stepped in. We read about that. And God said, how can, you, how can you criticize my servant Moses? God deals with ministry. Be very careful with ministry. Let God deal. Pray for it. Get out from under it if you have to. But let God deal with it. Because you don't want to touch the Lord's anointed. Aaron was a spokesperson for Moses. And Moses was a spokesperson for God. Moses was a prophet, but he was not only a prophet, because God said, I speak to him face to face, even plainly, and not in dark sayings. And Moses did not merely have visions and dreams as some prophets do. He saw the form of the Lord, the Bible says. When Moses asked to see the glory of God, God put him in the cleft of the rock and passed by. He said, I can't let you see my face or you'll die. But I'll let you see my hinder parts. And the Lord covered his face, passed by, and showed Moses his hinder parts. What was that? What did Moses see? Well, God is a spirit. An omnipresent spirit. And God is invisible as a spirit. All these are true biblical teachings. So when, when God showed Moses his glory, he showed Moses what he had done. That's how Moses could write about Adam and Eve in the garden. What Moses saw was truly awesome, but it was the back pipes or the hinder parts of the glory of God. We might say Moses saw the afterglow of where God's goodness had been. When it says face to face, it's a figure of speech, a way of explaining the clarity of the communication between Moses and God. It's not like God's face and Moses' face got together. God is an omnipresent spirit. Visions and dreams are not to be despised. God communicates through them, but they require an interpretation. And we have to be careful with visions and dreams because we want to get the interpretation right. Notice, in, even in church, it's called tongues and interpretation. It's not called tongues and translation. If it was tongues and translation, that means it should always be exactly right. But interpretation, we have to be very careful with. Does that make sense? Have you ever seen somebody trying to interpret a different language? You're trying to decipher. Does she mean goat or boy? <laughs> well, what's the context of the, of, the, of the sentence? All that matters in interpretations of different things. Amen? Amen? It all goes hand in hand with now we see through a glass darkly. Our sight is not perfected, so we have to walk very cautiously and hold to the word of God very dearly. But we are not to despise visions and dreams, because God does use them. But they do require interpretation. The Lord's word to Moses required no interpretation. God had a relationship with Moses that was face to face. In other words, I'm going to make it plain to Moses. Perhaps one reason for this was that Moses was called to write scripture. Other prophets wrote as well, including their visions and dreams, but they did not fully comprehend the meaning of all they wrote, as it appears Moses must have, because God made it very plain to him. True prophets do not pursue the ministry of the prophet. God's call is always involved. You never want to take this upon yourself. If someone calls themselves a prophet, I'm a little bit scared of them. But if somebody else says, now that's a prophet, then I pay attention. Brother T.W. Barnes in Mendon for years, I heard many men of God that I admired and respect say he's a prophet of God. But I never heard Brother Barnes call himself a prophet. But I heard stories about witches that tried to put spells on him and it would turn back and come back and get them. You don't mess with a real prophet of God. Now, Brother Barnes pastored a church. 
But I'm wondering, this is just my opinion. This is nothing else but my opinion. I'm wondering that because of the way we do things, the economy that we work within, the parameters that we have set, per se, that to be a prophet, if you're going to be in full-time ministry, you better be a pastor or something that can survive. So maybe that's where he defaulted to. But many men said, and if he preached, he wasn't the best preacher in the world. But boy, if he said, thus saith the word of the Lord, you better pay attention because what he said was going to happen. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah saying, Behold, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. And I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. The Lord knows who he calls into this ministry. And we need this ministry today. And we're going to have it in the end times. Especially with these two prophets of God that will help us during this time. But they might hurt our feelings too. Because God may tell them to tell us, tell them, don't do this. But 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 everybody else is doing it. Doesn't matter what everybody else is doing. Let me tell you, when it comes to the mark of the beast, you think you're pressurized right now. It's going to be the going thing. And if you don't take it, you're going to be crazy. Because it's going to fix all kinds of problems. It's going to be just what we've been needing. And I can't believe anybody wouldn't get on board with this. But them crazy Bible thumpers. But God's going to send us ministry that's going to say, No, don't you go there. And you better pay attention. Because usually when God speaks, he speaks by ministry. He may not do more than that for us. That may be it. In the New Testament, prophets are among the gifts God gives to the church for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come into the perfection of Jesus Christ. Now, Paul listed the prophet twice in two lists. Matter of fact, think about it. The apostles, your thumb, your prophet, your pointer finger. He points the way. The longest finger is, is your uh, evangelist. He has the greatest reach. And then your marriage finger is your covenant, the pastor. And then finally the, the teacher is the pinky. He can get in your ears. But in both lists in the Bible, the prophet is listed secondly on those lists. In Ephesians and in 1 Corinthians. Just in both lists, he's listed just after the apostles. What is the apostles? To me, the apostles symbolizes the government of the church. And we need government in the church. It is God's economy. Actually, if you look biblically, in the church, the Bible says we're not to go to court with one another. We are to go to the church elders and let them settle our disputes. Does that ever happen? No, nope, but that's the way it was supposed to happen. Because we're supposed to love each other so much that if we even get done wrong, we still put it in God's hands and move on. But that's what church government was about. And just as women prophets are seen in the Old Testament, like Miriam and Deborah and Hilda and Noadiah and Isaiah's wife are all called prophetess, so they are found in the New Testament, Luke chapter 2, verse 36. God is no respecter of persons. God does not look down and check your gender to see whether he can use you or not. That's false doctrine. Now, a woman is to be in a place of order. There should always, but so is a man. When I say that about ladies, I'm not saying men are excluded. Men are to be in a place of order also. Everyone is to be in a place of order. A prophet is given, is a person, a prophet, the office of a prophet is a person given to a specific role in the church. But when I speak of prophecy, it can happen through many people, not just a certain person. Because God can give the gift of prophecy as he sees fit to who he sees it, when he sees fit. But there are certain people that are prophets. In our Bible, Agabus was called a prophet in the New Testament. He foretold specific events. He foretold about a, a drought that was coming in the land. And he foretold about the, the death and the persecution of Paul. Notice, both of his messages weren't very good. I got a word from God. We're going to be real hungry for the next year. It's going to be a drought. Hallelujah. Let's shout and dance. We got a word from God. That's not how we respond. When we get a word from God, it's got to be something we wanted. Yeah. 
Yeah, the preacher said my bank account's going to fill up. Boy, we got a word this morning. But you know, the same God can say, you're not going to have any, any money tomorrow morning. Now, here's what we need to do. We don't, we don't do it, but here's what we need to do. Thank you, Lord, for telling me. So when it happens, I don't sing, I fall to pieces. No need in falling to pieces. God's already told you for it got here. Jesus himself in the word said, I told you these things before they happen. So that when they happen, you don't fall to pieces. When a prophet gives you a bad, what you call a bad word from God, say, well, hallelujah, thank you, Lord, for letting us know. And Agabus was a prophet, and he gave two prophecies, and both of them were bad. And when he prophesied about the persecution of Paul, you know what the church did? They pulled Paul aside and said, oh, Paul, don't do this. Don't go. Please don't go. Paul said, why do you weep and break my heart? I'm ready to be offered up for the cause of Christ. Amen. Quit crying. If this is what God wants, so be it. Yeah, but we don't want the will of God if it hurts. Yes, we do. We want the will of God no matter what it is. So we got to get out of this Americanized idea. If a prophet speaks, it's got to be a good word or we automatically disqualify him as a prophet. No. No. God can tell us stuff we don't want to hear, but we need to hear. <laughs> Philip the evangelist in our Bible had four daughters who prophesied, the Bible says. Since they are not identified as prophetesses, it may be simply they had the gift of prophecy working in their lives at that time. It is not it is no surprise to find false prophets mentioned in Scripture. There are always counterfeits to the gifts of God. <clears throat> the tendency of false prophets is to tell people what they want to hear. In the days of Jeremiah, when the Babylonian invasion was pending, some who claimed to be speaking for God assured the people there would be peace and no famine. And the Lord spoke to Jeremiah the prophet and said, These prophets prophesy lies in my name. I sent them not, neither have I commanded them, neither spake unto them. They prophesy unto you a false vision and divination. Divination means it's divine, but it's not from God. There's more spirits than God in this world. And a thing of naught and a deceit of the heart. So there are false prophets. That's why every time we get a prophecy or something like that, we should also always default to the word of God. And for me, I always default to the truth of the New Testament plan of salvation. Because somebody may say something that's true. But you know what? Even the devil will tell you a little bit of truth to deceive you with a lie. Jesus warned against false prophets and explained they could be known by their fruits. He said there would be many false prophets in the last days. And they would show great signs and wonders. And so if it was possible, they would deceive the very elect. Because they're going to have dynamic ministries. What do you mean you don't believe him? Did you see the miracles they had at that crusade? Yeah. And I heard they baptized everybody in titles. Sorry, I'm not supporting it. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not mentioning words. Just because you prophesy something, your plan of salvation better line up with the word of God. Amen. Peter pointed out that false teachers, like false prophets of old, bring indamnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them. And they bring upon themselves swift destruction. These false teachers are characterized by covetousness. They're in it for themselves. And they make merchandise of people. And John explained that there are spirits behind false teaching. He said, Beloved, this is in John chapter 1, verse 4, verse, John chapter 4, verse 1, 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, excuse me. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits. How do you try the spirits? This is my opinion. Use the word of God. Amen. Try the spirits, whether they are of God. 
Because my God will never tell you he's part of a group. I'm going to say that again. The God I serve will never tell you I'm the second in the Trinity. He'll never tell you that. The God I serve will tell you I am the only God and beside me there is no other. Amen. How do you know he'd do that? Because he's already done it in the Word. In the Old Testament, he looked around and said, there ain't nobody here but me. If that's what he saw then, that's what he sees now. Try the spirits whether they be of God. I'm going to tell you, they may have a bigger church. They may have a better ministry. They may feed more people and, ho and, and house more homeless. But if the word of God's not right, the foundation's not right. Doesn't matter what you build if the foundation's not right. It's all going to come crumbling down one day. He said, there are many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby we know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of the Antichrist, he said. In John's day, he was fighting a false doctrine of Gnosticism. And he was using this teaching to say, these people are not of God that are teaching this. When we speak of God coming in the flesh, we are speaking of Jesus Christ coming in the flesh. Not one part of God, not one person of God, but everything that is God was revealed in one body, even the man Jesus Christ. In addition to Scripture itself, the gift of the discerning of spirits is given to the church to help us in detecting false prophets and false people and false teachings. I've had people tell me stuff and the Holy Ghost will just click. Mm, okay. And I'll smile and shake my head and don't say anything. No need to say anything. When the Holy Ghost, everything God tells you, you don't need to repeat. Right. Just move on and give it time and God will work it out. But that is something God gives us to help discern spirits because the spirit, the spirits can be very deceptive. They can quote the right verse to you. You've got to have discerning of spirits. It is always possible, even with the gift of prophecy, for a person to go beyond what God is leading them to say because we are flesh. And if someone makes a mistake, always do understand you've made mistakes. For this reason, Paul wrote that those who prophesy should prophesy according to the proportion of their faith. I think what he's saying is don't look around at somebody that's got it more than you or better than you and try to be them. You try to be what God made you to be. Somebody told me one time, boy, that person of ours sure can pray good. I said, but God wants you to pray the way God designed you to pray. Amen. Don't you compare yourself to how they do it. Right. You pray, pray the best you can and grow in your prayers. Amen. The prophets who ministered in the era of the Old Testament reminded those to whom they spoke of the warnings God had given to Israel and the consequences for disobedience to the law of Moses. They also addressed events current at the time of their ministry and prophesied even the future events. Many messianic prophecies are in the Old Testament. In this sense, those Old Testament prophets spoke of the past, the present, and the future. So when you think of a prophet, that doesn't mean he's always going to talk about tomorrow. Sometimes he looks back and says, we better remember what God has done. Nathan responded with an immediate approval. When David came in wanting to build God a temple. Nathan the prophet, the Bible says, responded with, Go and do it, all that's in your heart, for God is with you. And that night, God knocked on the prophet's heart. Hey, Nathan. Yeah, Lord. Go back and tell David not to build that temple. Uh, I just told him he could, God. Yeah, you was wrong. See? Come on here. Prophets are not always exactly right. But if they're submitted to God, God will come knock on their heart and say, hey, go correct that. Yes, God, I will. And he went back in and said, David, you can't build that house. Well, yesterday you said, nope, I made a mistake. God is going to let your son build it, but you're not going to build it. Okay, thank you, Lord. And instead of getting angry and bitter, you know what David did? Let's start getting supplies together. Why? My boy's going to build a house for the Lord. 
When God don't let you have something, don't throw a pity party. God don't owe us anything. Instead of worrying about what everybody else has got, why don't you thank God for what you got? And I told you that so you'd realize prophets don't always get it just right. But if they're a true prophet, God will deal with them and they'll come back and rectify the situation. And the Lord revealed to Samuel, a child prophet, the future of Eli's family. And God did not let Samuel's words fall to the ground, the Bible says. Like their Old Testament counterparts, New Testament prophets foretold the future. Agabus foretold the famine and the persecution of Paul. And the church prayed that God would not do it. Thank God Paul was one of what God wanted. The purpose of prophecy in the New Testament era was to edify or to strengthen the church. That's the purpose of all ministry. It's to build up and strengthen the church. And sometimes the way God strengthens us is by telling us what we need to hear. Now, Moses anticipated the church. I love this. This is, go to Numbers chapter 11, verse 29. Numbers 11, verse 29. I must hasten. Numbers 11, verse 29. But Moses replied, Are you jealous for my sake? I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets and the Lord would put his spirit upon them all. Now Moses got half of what he wanted. Not all the Lord's people are prophets, but now every one of God's people should receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And the gift of the Holy Ghost is the spirit of prophecy. For Jesus Christ in Revelations is the spirit of prophecy. And the spirit of prophecy is more than foretelling. It's also foretelling. It gives us the power to witness. Yeah, amen. The boldness to witness. That's what the Holy Ghost does for us. And God now pours his spirit upon all flesh. We find this in Joel 2, 28. This shall come to pass. Joel said afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. They're not all prophets. But they'll all have the power to prophesy. That's more than foretelling. It's also foretelling. It means when you get the Holy Ghost, you get God's zeal. God's boldness, God's courage to do the work of God. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. But we go to 1 Corinthians. Go to 1 Corinthians for me, chapter 12. I'm almost done. You'll give me a few more minutes. Like Paul, I'm going to say, finally, brethren. We'll go another chapter or two. We'll be done. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 29. We'll start in verse 27, excuse me. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27 through 31. Now all of you together are Christ's body, and each one of you is a separate and necessary part of it. Here's a list of some of the members that God has placed in the body of Christ. First are apostles. Second are prophets. Third are teachers, and then those who do miracles, those who have the gift of healing, those who can help others, those who can get others to work together, those who can speak in unknown languages. Is everyone an apostle? Of course not. Is everyone a prophet? No. Are all teachers? Does everyone have the power to do miracles? Verse 30, does everyone have the gift of healing? Of course not. Does God give all of us the ability to speak in unknown tongues? Can everyone interpret unknown languages? No. Verse 31, and in, and in any event you should desire the most helpful gifts to the church. First, however, let me tell you about something else that is better than any of them. And he goes into the love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13. Love is a better way. He said, are all apostles? No. Are all prophets? No. Are all workers of miracles? No. But if you're a believer, you can lay hands on the sick and God can heal them. That doesn't necessarily mean you have the gift of healing. But there are people that have that gift. I believe that. 
There are people that have those things in their ministry. I remember a young man one time, he was an evangelist. He told me everywhere I go now, I ask the pastors, anyone here have diabetes? The pastor would say, why? He'd say, because God has given me the gift of healing of diabetes. Everything else, no. He said, but that one right there, I found out I'm, I'm having great success in that. Say what you want, but that worked for him. If you had diabetes, you'd be calling him. And God gives those at certain times and certain places to certain people. Now, the Bible does say, and I'll go ahead and take care of this, do all speak with tongues. This is for the edification of the church. Everyone does not have the gift of tongues and interpretation of tongues. But everyone will speak in tongues when they receive the Holy Ghost. I don't want to stutter on that. It's very clear in the scripture that speaking in tongues is used in three different ways in your Bible. One is when a person receives the gift of the Holy Ghost, there is a sound that comes that is seen and heard in your Bible. We know what that, and another one is a prayer language. When you have the Holy Ghost, I encourage you to pray in the Spirit. That's one of our weapons. When Paul lists the, the weapons of our warfare, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, he goes on to say all Sunday school lessons stop before they get all the equipment. Because all the other equipment is obvious to the enemy. But we have a secret weapon. He said with all prayer and supplication in the Holy Ghost. Because when I pray in the Spirit, I'm not praying my will on God. I'm praying God's will on me. And so when we pray in tongues, we are praying in the Holy Ghost. Paul tells us that in 1 Corinthians 14. If a man prays in an unknown tongue, he knows not what he prays. Well, then Paul said, what is it then? What am I going to do? He said, I'm going to answer it for you. I will pray in the Spirit, and I will pray in the understanding also. I will sing in the Spirit, and I will sing in the understanding also. I'm going to do both. But for the edifying of the church, tongues and interpretation is used in the church to edify the body. Prayer tongue is not to edify the body. It's to edify the believer. It's taught in Scripture. So you got the infilling of the Holy Ghost. You've got a prayer tongue to edify you personally. And then you've got the third one, which is the gift of tongues and interpretation, which is to edify the body of Christ. And so tongues interpretation works in the assembly of the believers. And when Paul talks about do all men speak with tongues, he is talking about what edifies the body. Hope that makes sense. I got a more, I got a more detailed Bible study if you need it on that. But don't get those things because there's a lot of people that you look at that and say, see, everybody don't speak in tongues. Well, then go explain John uh, over where he says about receiving the Holy Ghost. Amen. The wind bloweth where it listeth. Thou hearest the sound thereof. Cannot tell where it comes, where it goes. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Yeah. Now you're telling me everyone's not part of that verse. But Jesus said everyone was. Yeah. Somebody say praise the Lord. And some of his last words before his ascension, Jesus said, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. And one of the things that was written was, and we read that in our text today, Deuteronomy 18, The Lord God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thy brethren. And that prophet was Jesus Christ. Christ. He is the highest prophet of all prophets, and he is the one who gave us the word of God. He was God in the flesh giving us the word of God today. And I close with this. Go to Revelations 10 verse 7. Revelations 10 and 7. <clears throat> but when the seventh angel blows his trumpet, Seventh angel is the last angel, the last trump. God's mysterious plan will be fulfilled. It will happen just as he announced it to his servants, the prophets. He's foretold this to us. Go to Revelations 11, verse 1. You may or may not believe this is actually my last reading. Five more minutes. Some of y'all already got the, the cookers. Probably, you're probably thinking, Lord, don't let it burn. 
you know, used to be years ago that my mama would put the crock pot on before church and we'd go home and eat after church. Yeah, anybody still do that? Do you? Okay, all right. My wife does it every once in a while. Amen. Revelations 11, verse 1. That, those are the servers you say, Lord, move great, but don't move long. <laughs> do, a quick, do a quick work, Lord. Do a quick work. I'm sorry. Oh, listen, if you got nobody to pray for, you know you can pray for me. I need it. Hey, we can, we can be honest, can't we? <laughs> Revelations 11, verse 1, Then I was given a measuring stick, and I was told, Go and measure the temple of God and the altar, and count the number of worshipers. But do not measure the outer court, for it has been turned over to the nations, the Gentiles. They will trample the holy city for 42 months, three and a half years. And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will be clothed in sackcloth and will prophesy during those 1,260 days, three and a half years. They're going to be with us during the great... Aren't you glad God's going to give us some prophets? We're not going to have just the word of God. We're going to have two prophets that will have the ability, I believe, to get to us somehow or another. God's going to give us some strength. And it may well be that God gives us these two prophets because at this point in time, we're going to need the word of God, but we're also going to need more than that built up on. And God's going to give us what we need to make it. These two prophets are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of all the earth. If anyone tries to harm them, fire flashes from the mouths of the, of the prophets and consumes their enemies. This is how anyone who tries to harm them must die. They have power to shut up the sky so that no rain will fall for as long as they prophesy. And they have the power to turn the rivers and oceans into blood and to send every kind of plague upon the earth as often as they wish. Powerful men with dynamic ministries. When they complete their testimony, the beast that comes out of the bottomless pit, and that was the fifth trumpet, will declare war against them, and he will conquer them and kill them. Well, how can somebody defeat them? Because their testimony's done. And their bodies will lie in the main... Now, I, I'm of the, remember in, the, in the, uh, the fifth seal? Yes. Yeah, fifth seal. They said, how long, O oh Lord, before you avenge us of those on the earth? And the Lord said, wait till some more folks die. Who are we waiting on? These two right here to die. When these two right here die, that's it. And so it is, there's a truth here in this. When you cut off the preacher, God's done with you. And when they cut off these ministers, God said, that's it. No longer needing to wait. I don't have a voice to speak to them anyway. And their bodies will lie in the main street of Jerusalem, which the city which shall, is called Sodom and Egypt where the Lord was crucified. Of course, that's Jerusalem. And for three and a half days, all people, tribes, and language, and nations will come to stare at their bodies. No one will be allowed to bury them. It's just my opinion. There's a reason God don't want them buried either. Because God wants the whole world to see the dead in Christ rise first. These two are dead in Christ. All the people who belong to this world will give presents to each other and celebrate the death of these two prophets who had tormented them. But after three and a half days, the spirit of life from God entered them and they stood up and terror struck all who were staring at them. Then a loud voice from heaven said, come up here. And they arose to heaven and in a cloud as their enemies watched. In the same hour, there was a terrible earthquake that destroyed a tenth of the city. 7,000 people died in that earthquake, and everyone who did not die was terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe, the second terror is past. But look, now the third terror, what is the third terror? It is the seventh trumpet. The third woe, the third terror is the seventh trumpet. The dead in Christ have risen. And after that, what happens? Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Let's stand. That's good. Thank you. Thank you. God is so good to us.